Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all of the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Future Society, where we are talking about the future, but broadcasting from the present. We have Dr. Richard Scott with us today, and I'm really excited to speak with him because he's a biological anthropologist and a really well-known expert about the jaws and the teeth and something that is currently evolving as we're looking at it uh, in the recent future and the recent history. So, Dr. Scott, tell us a little bit about what your field of expertise is, and then we're going to talk about where we're going as a species. Okay. Well, I went to graduate school in the late 60s and early 70s, and uh, in, in what was called physical anthropology at the time, it's now shifted more to biological anthropology. And my research for my dissertation was on the uh, genetics of the tooth crown morphology. And so uh, an NIH genetics training grant supported me through four years of uh, doing uh, research on family studies. So, so basically, I'm a dental anthropologist. Uh, you know, I've done other things. My mentor is also into cannibalism. So I've fooled around with cannibalism a little bit since we're very close to the site of the Donner Party because I'm in Reno, Nevada, and uh, Truckee, where the Donner Party Truckee, California, where the Donner Party happened, is only about 30 minutes away. Jeez. And in 2004, I worked on an excavation of uh, of the Alder Creek site. And so, you know, that's kind of a secondary interest. But other than that, I have worked uh, with teeth for a very long time. As, although I'm a specialist on tooth crown and root morphology, I've done everything. I've done crown wear, uh, tooth size. Uh, stress markers on the teeth, uh, and oral tori. I, I love oral tori, and uh, I published uh, papers on both palatine and, and mandibular torus. So yeah. for those of you who aren't familiar, tori are these bony protrusions inside your mouth that are you know, usually located on the lower jaw, sometimes also on the upper jaw as well. I'm glad that we started with the dental morphology because one of the things that I know is happening right now is that we are evolving as a species. And when people think about the most common tooth that is removed, they think about their wisdom teeth, which is a remnant from when we were cavemen on the African savanna, right? We had much larger jaws, much different diet. Tell us a little bit about that and the evolution that you see why a lot of people need their wisdom teeth to be removed. Okay, well, I teach both primate evolution and paleoanthropology, and uh, I assure you, other primates do not have an issue with uh, wisdom teeth. Although I will tell you one interesting thing, and uh, maybe your audience doesn't know that, there is one family of primates that has a 2132 dental formula. They mm -hmm. have lost their third molars. And those are the calatricids in South America, the marmosets and the tamarins. Interesting. I was, say, I was going to say all primates have third molars, but then I remembered the marmosets and tamarins do not have third molars. But, uh, you know, coming on up through the hominoids, hominoids are basically apes and hominines. And so you go back into the Miocene, which extends back 23 million years ago. You look at all the jaws and teeth of Miocene hominoids, they all, all have third molars. Now, the interesting thing, and this is true of primates too, is that the third molars are usually the largest tooth. They are not only there invariably, they are also the largest. And so by the time we get to hominines, say, four million years ago, that is still true. And that remains true for a time but about 2 million years ago, uh, and it's probably coincident with the greater dependence on meat eating. 
And that may be through hunting or scavenging, but there's a lot of indirect evidence that hominins started eating more meat uh, around that time. Brains got bigger, body size got bigger, teeth got smaller. And so that basically uh, set the course for the next two million years as teeth over the course of time generally got smaller. And the interesting thing about that is that the, the teeth that get smaller first are the most distal members of a tooth group. And a tooth group or a tooth district is like the first, second, and third molar. So the tooth that starts getting smaller, smaller first is the third molar. And over the course of two million years, that continues to occur. And the second molar then starts getting smaller. So in modern people, we see exactly the opposite tooth size sequence uh, that we saw in earlier hominids. Because in modern people, M1 is the biggest tooth, M2 is the next biggest, and M3 is the smallest tooth. And I think uh, missing third molars is a part of this overall evolutionary trend to tooth size reduction. So now populations are often missing third molars. And so I guess my question, I have a few questions when you're saying that. So we used to eat only vegetables and, uh, and you know, plants, excuse me. And then now we've transitioned to more of a meat eating diet over the course of the past 2 million years. And our teeth are getting smaller because of that. Why, why does that happen when you're meat eater? Why is that something that requires smaller teeth? Uh, because meat is actually less abrasive mm. than plant products. Mm. You know, because the early Australopithecines, they were probably eating a lot of uh, uh, roots and uh, underground storage plants in addition to leaves and uh, leaves and fruits. I mean, orangutans, for example, eat really hard, hard fruit that requires, you know, a, a good significant bite and a lot of mastication. And so meat, remarkably, uh, it requires uh, less chewing. And when you start, and when cooking starts, that accelerates the process even more. Mm -hmm. And we're not exactly, you know, there's still some question as to when hominids uh, were able to use and control fire, but it could be somewhere between 500,000 and a million years ago. So by the time you get to some of the uh, hominids in Europe about a half million years ago, their jaws are still fairly large, but their teeth are definitely getting smaller. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we can only assume that that reflects the kind of uh, uh, diet that they're focusing on. Now, I don't know if your readers are familiar with this, but uh, there is a uh, uh, between two and three million, well, actually between one and three million years ago, there is a distinct dichotomy in, in hominids between what are called the robust Australopithecines and the gracile Australopithecines. And the robust Australopithecines have enormous molars. And uh, not only do they have enormous molars, they have enormous premolars. And because of that, their anterior teeth are greatly reduced in size. And so basically, they their diet focused almost exclusively on crushing and grinding. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically what you see in a robust australopithecine is what you see in ungulates that are grazers and browsers, where the premolars are incorporated into the molar row. Mm -hmm. and, and the other forms, you don't see that with the premolars. So when you're talking about the evolution of the teeth, I feel like uh, I understand what you're saying about teeth size, but the jaw size is also decreasing, correct? Yes. <laughs> and yes. So, so, you know, like I went to um, the catacombs in France and I've been to the catacombs in Rome and those people have perfect teeth. They, this is before orthodontics, before braces. What do we know about just the widespread need for kids and braces these days? You know, I, 
I've done much the same thing. I've I've scored uh, uh, tooth crown root morphology in thousands of of all kinds of people, including Europeans. Mm-hmm. And last summer, we scored almost a thousand Hungarians that dated between the fifth century and the seventeenth century, and they had relatively little tooth crowding. So, mm-hmm. so your observation is very much in line with my. Uh, claim on the Ted Ed that I think brought brought me to your attention initially, because I think the tooth crowding, and I've talked to Dennis about this too, seems to be primarily a product of the last couple hundred years uh, associated with changes in food processing uh, during after the Industrial Revolution. So it's not just tied to agriculture. I mean, you do. It seems like two sides and jaw size uh, were declining at about the same pace. But then all of a sudden, uh, our teeth, <laughs> our jaw, we just weren't stressing our jaws uh, as we did in earlier times. And, and jaw size is more plastic than tooth size. Tooth so, size is under strong genetic control. Gotcha. So, like, if you look at, hunter-gatherer societies that exist right now, like, um, let's say, um, you know, on the plains of the African savanna, there's still societies that exist ent- entirely with a hunter-gatherer social structure. So mm-hmm. those people have perfectly straight teeth. And so you're saying that because they have more chewing in their diet, that it's a tougher diet than mm-hmm. their jaws are stimulated to grow right. and they don't have crowding. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I can give you a really good example of uh, what, what happens too. In the, it, I, I taught at the university of Alaska for 24 years. And uh, so I studied, you know, a lot of Inuit dentitions and uh, uh, the dentists in Alaska would sometimes tell me uh, that uh, with the adoption of European dietary elements, especially highly processed foods in the 1930s, all of a sudden Inuit, the, the prehistoric Inuit never had tooth crowding. Mm-hmm. And not only, I'll tell you something ironic about that, they not only didn't have tooth crowding, they have the highest frequency of third molar agenesis in the world. Mm even though they have plenty of space in their jaws. Interesting. They have a lot of third molar agenesis. It's probably twice as high as you'd find in Europeans. Hmm. But, but what the dentist noted to me was that with the adoption of European foods, uh, processed foods, all of a sudden there was tooth crowding. And because orthodontia in, in the villages was not practical, they started pulling a lot of premolars. Mm-hmm. And I know that's pretty standard practice, even in, you know, an American society. When there's tooth crowding, sometimes pulling a premolar uh, is is good enough mm-hmm. to take care of a, a crowding issue. So what is, so a lot of this stuff for me, I feel like is anecdotal. I see this in skull size and jaw size throughout history and i'm making my own uh determinations based on things that i i hear from experts like yourself i I don't know the science behind it and do what what is the mechanism for this is it just something that we know through population studies or do we know like the causative factors and how those causative factors cause the outcomes there are a lot of studies on human plasticity, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, unfortunately, it's it's hard to <laughs> experiment with uh, humans. But mm-hmm. uh, when I was putting that TED Ed together, I did find uh, two two sets of experiments where th- they fed. In one case, uh, they had two groups of squirrel monkeys, and one they they fed a, a diet that had very refined food that didn't require much mastication. And the other group, they fed, you know, traditional squirrel monkey food. And there was uh, definitely more crowding in the group that uh, was fed the diet of, you know, highly processed food. 
And they, they did the same thing with a bunch of hyraxes. Uh, so you can see plasticity in, in many arenas. Uh, human stature is subject to, to great plasticity. So it's just the skeleton uh, responds to, to two things, really, nutrition and stress. Mm -hmm. and, and the physical stress is placed upon it. You know, when I was looking at uh, prehistoric Inuit samples, uh, they, they put a great deal of stress on their skeleton. And mm -hmm. so they show pronounced uh, what are called musculoskeletal markers. Mm -hmm. And so, and it, and their jaws were very much the same. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, a, a fellow named Lehman Waugh back in the 1930s uh, did a, wanted to estimate the bite force in uh, native populations in Alaska. And he put what's, you're, you're given your field, you probably know all about this. He, he put an, a natho dynamometer between the first molars and had them bite down. And I can still remember the averages for males and females. The average for males was 280 pounds per square inch. And for females, it was 240. Wow. For American white athletes, it was like 110. Wow. So, I mean, Eskimos or I mean, Inuit could generate enormous bite force. And mm -hmm. I think this is given your interests in craniofacial architecture. I think you would find uh, it very interesting how the, the Inuit skull is, is of such a nature that the way the, the jaws are pulled in, the way the temporal muscles are hypertrophied, I mean, that they can generate enormous bite force. And uh, that's, that's super interesting. I guess when I think about skeletal growth and, you know, where we're going as a society, you know, first off, like, you know, we're all getting taller because of the better nutrition, right? And the the forces are getting less. I just feel like, is that all we know about how the bones grow and, and jaws grow? Is that, is it just that simple? Or is, I mean, obviously it's not, it's more complex, mm -hmm. but do we know like the pathophysiology, like the physiology, but how, how this happens? Like it, specifically in regards to just like the evolution over time, right? Like where we were 200 years ago to where we are now, you know, there's this hypothesis that's out there about the processed foods, but like what is happening with the lack of force that causes our jaws to be smaller? Well, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure about all those sure. mechanisms, but there is a a new field. It's actually an old field, but it has uh, been given new life in the last 20 years, and that's epigenetics. Yeah. And, uh, you know, C.H. Waddington back in the 40s and 50s uh, talked about the epigenetic landscape and everything, but it really wasn't until they were able to, to tie the genomics into uh, genetics that they, they were able to see some of these things. Now, the point of epigenetics for your readers is that that is where you can actually have changes take place in 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 terms of the genes that uh, moderate development without an actual change in the DNA sequence. Basically, what epigenetics does is that it will uh, either promote or inhibit. Uh, DNA from producing an end product or a protein. And so they, they have discovered, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, the Dutch hunger thing from around World War II. And the interesting thing is how this can be uh, transmitted from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. So it's not just DNA that's transmitted. Sometimes these uh, the sins of the fathers can be passed on to the offspring. Yeah, I mean, they say that about smoking, right? Like it's two yeah. generations before a history of smoking gets deleted from the the gene pool. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think that that's something that we don't talk about enough. I think that epigenetics in regards to the benefits of epigenetics are are very much talked about, and that you can change your genes 
to benefit you. I don't think that we talk enough about the choices that you make today affecting future offspring and the negative, specifically in regards to smoking. Uh, I think that that's something that, you know, we just, you know, we talk about that it will affect you if you're pregnant, but it's not something that's talked about as just lifestyle before and after pregnancy. My concern is that you know, we're undergoing this disevolution process. Like we're, we're not evolving to become more competitive. We're evolving to become less competitive and more prone to disease and more prone to, to all of these things. And I guess, am I wrong in that? I'm only looking at it from a negative light, you know, and I just see a lot of these problems with that are happening on a much more rapid basis, but the whole purpose of this podcast is to inspire people to, you know, to be hopeful about the future. And I see that this thing, this is a societal issue. Nobody's going to give up on their soft food, right? Like everybody oh. loves French fries. Everybody loves, you know, ice cream. Yeah. Am I wrong in that? And how do you see a way to to fix that? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm into the fixing business, but but I do know that people uh, should at least be made more wary of the various uh, environmental inputs that can affect their health and the health of their offspring. Because uh, things like pollution, things like food additives, uh, I, I don't even know how many things are out there besides smoking that can have an impact on on epigenetic uh, machinery and and that epigenetic machinery sometimes uh, uh like autoimmune diseases you know mm -hmm. when, when i was young i'd never even heard of autoimmune diseases and like peanut allergies things like that those mm -hmm. things seem to be so much more ubiquitous than they used to be mm -hmm. and so you know, to, to put a positive spin on things, I'm not sure I can do that except to to encourage people to be more wary of of how the environment can can alter them. In some cases, their offspring. Yeah. Well, what about you know? I mean, you see these like specifically when it comes to jaw size, you see a lot of really new companies coming out with like really hard gum. And, you know, jaw exercise machines, like, it, is there any credence to that? Or is this just, what do you, how do you feel about that? I don't know. I know in the, in the TED Ed that ended with something like that, if uh, we could somehow exercise our jaws the way we exercise our, our bodies to, to stimulate growth to the point where our jaws matched our teeth better. Mm -hmm. uh, I honestly don't know, though, because, in earlier times, the behaviors that that place stress on the, the, the jaws and dentition were were habitual. You mm -hmm. know, they, they occurred naturally, they occurred every day. So if you did something like that, uh, for example, 30 minutes a day, I don't know how that would compare to basically something that was a normal activity in earlier times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it may be a step in the right direction. And hopefully, you know, folks in your field and uh, other areas of developmental biology will will do some experiments with things like that. But it's going to have to be over, you know, a pretty long period of time. So if you follow kids from the eruption of their permanent teeth uh, till they're 18, you know, if you can get money from NIH, for a 10 year grant, maybe you can do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that we don't really understand growth in general, whether it's the, the craniofacial complex or, you know, like the, the <laughs> face and, and jaws or, or even your arms, you know, I, I don't think it's something that we, we understand. Um, but just taking like a bird's eye view of it, what other, you know, you're, you're close enough to anthropology, uh, in the general aspect to know some other things that might be disevolution that's happening because, you know, I think that many people don't even know about what's going on with the face. I think that that's something that, that when I watched that video, I, I thought it was just so, so to, just to keep everybody, you know, up to, to speed, uh, Dr. Scott had a video that he made for Ted Ed, which he's referencing many times that, talks about the evolution of the jaws and how our jaws are getting smaller and and all of the 
the issues that are rising with that. But my point is that many people don't know that to begin with. What are some other things that are evolving in the opposite direction, not in the opposite direction, but become making us less competitive as a species? What are some other things that are going on that that might be interesting to to people that didn't know about that? Oh, you, you mean in the dentition or in general? Just in general. Yeah, just in general. Okay. You know, I travel the world looking at teeth. And uh, well, I'll give you an example. <laughs> I was in Spain a few years ago and I went to, you know, I, I'd eaten a lot of Spanish food. So I went to a Burger King and there was a warning on the wall that said, warning, we serve American sized portions. <laughs> And it, it's my experience traveling around the world. I, I, I've been going to Europe for almost 50 years. And in 1976, I went to Switzerland for a month, actually to study in with skeletons. Mm. And uh, everybody was skinny. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody was thin. And, uh, you know, maybe I went back in 1986, and I think it was still pretty much that way. But I've been back another dozen times, and the obesity problem is not just a problem in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, and I spent a sabbatical even in Australia, and I think it, it's almost as bad in Australia as it is in this country. Mm. So I, I think, you know, that is kind of a <laughs> dystopian, but, uh, but I think we have to come to grips with uh, cheap calories. And and how we can avoid fat storage and type two diabetes. I mean, because I know you're trying to look at the positive things in the future, but but there's some things, and and I'm I'm part of these that I mean I I'm on the border of type two but diabetes myself, and it's uh, it's so hard in this day and age. Of course, that generates uh, uh, an enormous industry in fitness. And so mm -hmm. there are fitness gyms all over all over the place. Mm -hmm. But whether or not people use those on a regular basis, I know some people will join a 24-hour fitness or LA fitness and just have a subscription <laughs> and not actually uh, make a habit of going there. And I speak from personal experience, so I, I know what I'm talking about. So there are people in this country that are are very concerned about their nutrition very concerned about their their fitness but there are probably many more who are not and uh, like you said before french fries are are, <laughs> are loved by men delicious they, oh, I mean, God. they're so good <laughs> um but the, you know what i what i would say is that like what are you seeing in the anthropological record that is a consequence of obesity, that is a consequence of our evolving social structure? Because, you know, I, I know that the jaws are one thing. I feel like it's it's like this low-hanging fruit that everybody knows about because they have to treat it. Everybody has a kid that has to put be put through braces. But, you know... I, there's certain things about anthropology that just like blow my mind. Like, for example, somebody was telling me the other day that we measure the anthropological record in the sediment based on the amount of chicken bones that are thrown. I don't know if that's accurate, but like they call that the Anthropocene era because we've just been eating so much chicken that we we throw it in. And it's like you can I don't know if that's just like, you know, a rumor and and it's like a, a false wives tale. But the fact of the matter is, is that we're entering into this uh, uh, conversation. And I feel like there's so many things that I want to ask of you, but like, I don't know, you know. And so what what is going on with the current society that you could tell us that you're seeing in the anthropological record? Wait, I'm I'm a little confused. The current society, you know, I can talk about past populations and provide some context for the direction we've gone mm -hmm. over the course of the Holocene. Mm -hmm. Now, I I tell my introductory students this all the time: uh, humans reach their peak form during the Upper Paleolithic mm. between twelve and forty thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. 
These people were robust. They had brains that were bigger than modern brains. Wow. The average brain size was between 1450 and 1500. It's probably about 100 cubic centimeters less now. So our brains are smaller. Our bodies are smaller, despite, you know, the the secular trend we've seen in recent times. That was Mm. not always true. If uh, if you go back to the Middle Ages, <laughs> and if you've ever seen the the knight the suits of armor in uh, London, these guys were little. Yeah, were little. So the secular trend is relatively recent. But uh, so so sorry, just to cut you off for just a second. So okay. Homo sapiens were larger in the past, then they got smaller, and then now we're getting big again. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So this uh, is not like this is not like Neanderthals. These are like Homo no, sapiens. No, 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 no. What we are right now, Neanderthals larger, are damn tough. So how the, tall were they? Which the modern humans are? No, no. The the paleo. You, when you're talking about yeah, the apex, yeah. like uh, how tall? How tall were they? They well, they may not have been any taller than say some of the tallest populations now, but mm-hmm. they're probably one seventy to one seventy two centimeters. You know, five ten, something like that, on average. Okay. And, and, but the, see, the thing is, they were. Sometimes I think people lose sight of the fact that humans are animals. Mm-hmm. And when we started uh, adopting cultural things to make our lives easier, we no longer have big big canines to to jump on prey and kill prey with, and. Uh, <clears throat> You know, we have to to use tools, and so uh, tool using was a big, a big revolution. And so, over the course of time, basically the Upper Paleolithic folks, they did not overeat. They basically they were told there were no grocery stores. They had to go out and earn their food, and so that involved a lot of movement. And so they were. Uh, Earlier hunter gatherers like that. Uh, I'll tell you something interesting. Neanderthals, for the most well, as far as I know, they were basically limited to caves, and so their subsistence round basically would involve moving out from a cave and then back, out from a cave and back, etc. Uh, whereas Upper Paleolithic, when we get to that point, about 30, 35,000 years ago, we start seeing open air shelters. And which means that these people could do seasonal rounds. And so they were on the move a lot. And so uh, not only were they moving around the landscape uh, uh, to better exploit certain resources during particular times of the year, but, uh, you know, when they were in a particular camp, uh, they would have to go out and hunt. Uh, and so, sometimes they'd have to chase down game. Sometimes they'd trap it. Mm-hmm. How they got it? It was hard work. Mm-hmm. And so they were stressing. Uh, they were stressing their uh, cran- uh, their post cranial skeleton. And when they bring that in to eat, now they would oftentimes cook their food, and so that would uh, help a bit. The teeth were not nearly as large as they were in earlier times. But at least they were still putting, uh, they were stressing their jaws to a considerable extent. And so, you know, from a health standpoint, you hardly ever see cancer in those earlier populations. So, uh, and I'll tell you an interesting contrast, too, between a hunting and gathering group and modern uh, populations. Mm-hmm. A, a professor of mine uh, did a study of osteoarthritis mm-hmm. and in Inuit pop, prehistoric Inuit populations, and almost all of their osteoarthritis was in the wrists, the elbows, and the shoulder. Whereas osteoarthritis in <laughs> American populations is in the ankle, the knee, and the hip. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the Inuit were great from, from a lower limb standpoint. It was their upper limbs that they were really stressing. But in modern populations, the stress is on the lower the lower joints, and much of that is related to being overweight. 
So that's that that you answered my question um, very well, which, you know, uh, I apologize for the the difficulty in a- asking it. But the fact of the matter is, is that we are seeing changes from modern society, the obesity epidemic, things, these modern maladies causing changes in the way that human beings appear that that the way that we are evolving is being affected to the negative but i think it's really interesting to look back to the what you say is the apex of of humanity's uh physical stature so first off just quick question you said that you they never died from cancer is that because they had a shorter lifespan or like like what was their lifespan like well you know i was just thinking about lifespan Uh, yeah Lifespan probably was less back in those days. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, there is evidence, even with Neanderthals, uh, you, uh, it's interesting that taking care of the elderly, you know, like I've seen Neanderthals that were almost edentulous. And so they would have had trouble uh, eating. And some Neanderthals had a lot of, a lot of arthritis because they really stressed their, their skeletons too. But uh, and some were amputees, some had amputated limbs. And so they reached a point, Margaret Mead even said this, that uh, this is really the hallmark of modern humans when they started taking care of those who could not take care of themselves. Yeah, I remember that in my college anthropology class. It, it totally changed my perspective of of how we've evolved as a species. But anyway, my point being is so they, okay, so maybe lifespan might've been a thing. They might've been healthier, but certainly they were at the apex physically. And I guess two questions that I have, number one was, were they able to obtain the same amount of nutrients that we are in modern society? Or because theoretically, like if if you're maximizing height, if you're maximizing weight, Mm -hmm. they should be having the best nutrients, right? So they had access to that when we were hunter gatherers. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm sure they had access to to great food. And and think about it, there were no additives. Mm-hmm. I mean that you know they were eating it <laughs> pure as pure. It was all grass fed. It was yeah. all organic. Yeah, yeah. And so you know there there were no pesticides or herbicides or anything like that. Yeah, they had to worry about getting caught by a cave bear or a cave lion. So uh, some some people think that not only is you know the advent of taking care of of our compatriots part of the the real marker of what it is to be human, but many people think that what you eat and how you cook it and how you prepare it, flavor in general was this factor that caused us to expand rapidly like the not only were we getting adequate nutrients but we were cooking them in such a way that made it tastier was how do you feel about that uh is that a controversial thing or is that an established hypothesis because i know that there's some you know um anthropologists that say taste was was what caused us to to develop well, I mean, taste after the age of discovery, I think uh, the value placed on spices mm-hmm. uh, indicates that uh, taste was very significant. You mm-hmm. know, back at earlier times, it always makes me nervous when I buy bacon and it's uh, covered with pepper. Now, I love pepper, but I know in older, in, in earlier times, uh, they would uh, cover the <laughs> cover meat with pepper that was a little bit on the <laughs> <laughs> Rants of salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, salt it has been an incredibly uh, valuable resource. I mean, some some cultures made their entire living uh, mining and hauling salt. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and, and think about it before refrigeration. Uh, think how people had to uh, to store food mm-hmm. as uh, you know, maybe dried and cured, food. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, drying, yeah, and I in, in Europe you still see a lot of dried meat. You don't see nearly as much of that in in the, the United States. Yeah, I remember in Switzerland, and when I went there, they they would uh, hang meat in a dry place, and and then it's kind of like prosciutto. 
Mm -hmm. Prosciutto is kind of the exemplar of that. In Spain, it's Mm hamon. But but that is a a way of uh, taking care of uh, meat without it uh, rotting or getting spoiled. Mm -hmm. But the Spice Islands in general, you know, all kinds of spices came from from the East Indies. uh, And I think that was one of uh, Columbus's motivations probably was to to get to the Spice Islands and he ended up in the West Indies. Yeah. So what, so what, uh, what about like, so if these people had access to nutrients and they had access to taste and flavor and the ability to prepare it, were they also getting cavities? Is that, is, or was the, were, was that significantly less? Well, cavities are kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I've studied the, the, the Greenlandic Norse, and medieval Norwegians and Vikings. And the Greenlandic Norse and Icelanders had no cavities at all. The the medieval Norwegians had some cavities, but they were mostly between the teeth, not on the tooth crowns. They were interstitial caries. The Vikings had the most caries. And I've always been a little puzzled by that, but I've always you know, thought that they they were drinking mead. They loved their mead, which is basically an alcoholic beverage made out of honey. Mm -hmm. And and so, but but people used to wear their teeth a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And so when they'd wear their teeth, they they basically eliminate all the little fissures and grooves on the crowns of the teeth, which are often exactly where the bacteria like to hole up until they bore a hole into the pulp. Mm-hmm. So, so caries was definitely a, a lot lower in earlier times. And, mm-hmm. and in more recent times, my God, you know, caries really exploded with when they uh, transplanted sugar cane to West Indies after yeah. the age of discovery, because sugar before that was uh, very expensive. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty much limited to people who had a lot of money. But yeah. Everybody had access to sugar. Uh, Carries rates went way up. They started wearing their teeth less, and they had more refined sugar in their diet. And uh, so, so complex sugars are not not really the the problem. It's really refined sugars. So, when you have refined sugars, like let's say in the, like the last two hundred years, right? Like let's say in the eighteen hundreds. Many people have easy access to refined sugars. Has the technology of dentistry caught up to make that caries or the cavities rate lower? Uh, or is it continuing to go higher because we're having more and more options for us? Yeah, well, well not being a dentist, I'm not going to claim any expertise. But I knew yeah. I do know this when I would even when I was a boy, which was <laughs> 60 years ago now, uh, they put something on my teeth, teeth called plastic seals. And I assume they still do that. You know, mm-hmm. they paint this on and then use ultraviolet light. And, and I think the goal there is to prevent those uh, acidogenic bacteria from finding a home in those fissures. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> I have a few carries didn't work perfectly, but I have, I have three sons and I'm not sure about my oldest son, but my middle son who j- turns 34 next month has zero carries. He's never had a carries in his life. My younger son who who used to have a real sweet tooth has had lots of carries. And at one time he had so many carries, they couldn't do them all in one sitting. Mm-hmm. So so it's really interesting that, because I know, you know, I will always query my students on this. And there are a lot of students that have no carries whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And then there are others who their mouth is full of amalgams and crowns and things. And so I can't help but, the, you know, I know there's obviously a huge environmental component to this, but I cannot help but think that genetics plays some part in this as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's in terms of, well, I don't know, you know, because people vary tremendously in, in calculus in their mouth. Some people have very self, self cleansing mouths 
and some don't. Mm -hmm. So, so there's so much going on inside the mouth. You, it, it's hard to sort it all out. Yeah. So I guess, uh, in regards to your own philosophies about health, this is, you know, just your own opinion. Do you feel like some of these new things that are coming out, like the paleo diet and, you know, the, the push towards becoming more like our paleolithic ancestors, do you think that that's appropriate? Do you think that that's like a bunch of marketing gimmicks or what, how do you feel about that? No, I, I think if, when it's possible to do that, I, I, I think it's probably a pretty good idea. As mm -hmm. I've said, I mean, the, the Paleolithic folks were, were in pretty darn good shape. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's what they're trying to emulate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if to, to eat a lot of fiber to get to protein. Uh, you know, I've tried keto. I mean, but keto is, <laughs> keto is the classic Inuit diet. Mm -hmm. They had hardly any carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they had so few carbohydrates. Well, I worked on the Seward Peninsula in 75 and our Inuit guide had uh, greens that had been harvested and were preserved in seal oil. That's how precious carbohydrates were. Wow. But they have a really super high fat, high protein diet. And uh, but carbohydrates if, if you eat nothing but protein and fat and mm -hmm. you go into ketogenesis it it can uh, you can definitely lose weight doing that i lost weight doing that but uh, it's also been linked to arctic hysteria oh yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so when when you're having a diet like that i mean what are their health outcomes like are they are they living a long time are they like are they susceptible to cardiovascular disease uh, well, well, interestingly, they have these various uh, uh, SNPs, uh, fatty acid dehydrogenase. They have these uh, genes in high frequency. There's a lot of omega-3s in their diet, and mm. they do not have many uh, uh, circulatory problems, you know. Mm. So mm. that's not inherently bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the saturated fats that will get you. Yeah. What but about the earlier? I'm sorry. I'm just going to say in earlier sure. times, they did not live very long, though. Their right. average lifespan was probably about 50. Mm. Mm -hmm. And w what were they dying from? Just like trauma or? <sighs> well, for one thing, they would, uh, their teeth, like I said, generate enormous stress yeah. and show a lot of tooth wear. Right. And, uh, eventually, they'd lose all their teeth. I've seen uh, skeletons that were so arthritic, they literally couldn't bend their arms at the elbow. Oh, geez. Yeah. And, and so in earlier times, there used to be a, a thing called senilicide. And you know, obviously, it's not practiced now, but, you know, some individuals would get to the point where life was so... You were you were so much on the edge that uh, you basically, if you weren't carrying your weight, you would say, "Okay, I, I'm going to make this decision to just, you know, go out on a nice flow to so my kids will will have." Wow! Wow! So, I mean, jeez! I mean, I don't think we can even imagine how how tough life was in earlier times oh yeah yeah i mean i'm sitting here in air conditioning and you know and talking to somebody halfway across the world it's like a, yeah, yeah. Even, even just like 10 years ago it's tough to imagine what the next 10 years is going to be like because we're on this logarithmic growth phase um so what about what about airways how have they changed over the course because of the past however many hundred years because i feel like that's another big topic these days of how our airways have changed you have significant rates of sleep apnea people with you know uh high vaulted palates and i don't know if that's again an epigenetic thing because of 
us living inside, we're exposed to allergens. You know, people are mouth breathing more because their noses are stuffed up. W- w- tell me a little bit more about what you know about that. Oh, I don't. I my experience there is almost entirely personal because uh, mm-hmm. when I was 15 years old, I've only had two su- surgeries in my life. But when I was 15, I had sinus surgery. And I have no idea, you know, some of us, it's kind of like some people have cavities and some don't. Some have sinus problems and some don't. Mm -hmm. I've looked at a lot of x-rays and you can see the maxillary and the the frontal sinuses. And there's a lot of variation in those. And for some reason, I've never even understood why I have so so many sinus issues and other people have none. So I, I I can't really speak authoritatively to that, but but I do know that the sleep apnea and things like that are definitely on the rise. And what's triggering that? Like I say, I'm I'm not an authority there. Yeah, can you are you able to to know what the airways of Paleolithic individuals or early hominids are like? Because it's all soft tissue, right? So it's probably yeah. not available in the in the record correct well all we can actually see directly uh, are the dimensions of the the what we call nasal breadth and nasal height Mm -hmm. and i can tell you uh, two things there that have always puzzled me because neanderthals had enormous noses Mm -hmm. they had very broad noses very high noses I mean, they must have had huge, a huge proboscis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and they've always said, well, that's a cold adaptation because Neanderthals lived during the height of the last glacial period. Mm -hmm. But then again, Inuit populations have very narrow nasal passages. Mm. And uh, they have the, the lowest nasal index in the world. Hmm. So th- that's supposed to be cold adaptation. So what is it? Is it these really broad Neanderthal noses or the narrow Inuit noses mm-hmm. that are involved in the cold adaptation? So people vary. It's it's pretty latitudinally graded, though, you know, excluding Neanderthals. As you go from the north to the south, uh, the nasal index definitely changes. So when you're saying that the, it changes from the north to the south, that's one thing. But does it change from, uh, other than the Neanderthals, Homo sapiens specifically, does it change from the past thousand years to now? Probably probably not dramatically. Yeah. Okay. I, Interesting. I never think much about it. I mean, I'm usually looking at teeth <laughs> and noses don't, don't strike me one way or another. So... Yeah, I noticed anything you know all that dramatic. Gotcha. So uh, I did want to talk to you about one last thing. One of the so anthropology is just kind of a, a hobby of mine. It's some, one of the things I'm interested in. Um, one of the theories that's out there for why we have noses the way that we do, why we have less hair than other primates, is this theory about us being aquatic apes. That there was a certain time of our history where we were either in and around water for a long time. How do you feel about that? Is that is that a real theory or has it pretty much been debunked? How do you feel about that? I think it's a crock of rocks. Okay. <laughs> Elaine Morgan, I saw this you know, what 40 years ago, the aquatic ape theory. And yeah. Uh, Elaine Morgan, she was not an anthropologist. I don't. She was a okay. little bit of a crackpot because, uh, you know, t- I can still remember the description she had of, of the Pliocene. It was so hot and desiccating that these hominids got in the water just to keep cool. And all of a sudden, they, they, they learned not only did they lose their hair, they learned to be bipedal in the water. Mm. So, no, I do not subscribe to the aquatic ape theory. Okay, no worries. Um, well, not to end on too controversial a topic, but <laughs> I hope I don't get canceled by the anthropology community. Um, but the fact oh, of the matter okay. is, hey, listen, it's yeah. Out. No, this was a really interesting talk. I wish I wish that we could um, talk more, uh, but we are getting to the end of our time. And at the end of our time, I always ask 
my guests three questions, uh, things that I would hope that, uh, you know, I could have gotten to, but I wasn't able to in the time that, uh, that we were allotted or because the conversation was going in a certain direction. So without further ado, one of the things I'd always ask my guests, you know, for me, uh, a lot of the inspiration that I get from my work and for my passions is, uh, the science fiction and literature that I consume. Um, science fiction is a big part of my life and it, what makes me very hopeful about the future, especially when you see utopian science fiction, where you have a, um, a human race that is in a better place than we are right now. What do you gain inspiration from when it comes to literature? Hopefully you're a science fiction buff like myself. If not, what are you reading that really gets you passionate and, and gives you a zest for working? Well, most of my reading is <laughs> technical material, but I have, yeah. I've read, I, I do like science fiction. Uh, but one thing uh, about science fiction that kind of ties into our general discussion today is uh, whenever, uh, I'm sure you've seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And it's just a, an example. Of, you've seen many of these. And these little guys get off the, the, the big ship and they are they have two arms two legs a head a mouth two eyes uh, uh, they're bilaterians and uh, the the probability of a bilaterian development from a from an alien planet i think is extremely remote so so my theory is if these people really are uh, aliens it's they're from another time not mm -hmm. from another space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people coming back in time that's cool because it, they and you know it's funny because the way they're always portrayed they have enormous heads mm -hmm. big brains and little teeny jaws and i'm sure you know <laughs> very their teeth. I, I have no idea what how their teeth would be portrayed. Yeah. Uh, They're probably just getting French fries just directly delivered into yeah. their mouths without, without yeah. any teeth. But, no, uh, but I agree with you. I think that that's something that's interesting to see where you know um you have science fiction, how it's it's not only like an idea of where we're going as a species, but also a lot of the stuff like aliens and our thoughts of of what we are is also consistent with how we think of ourselves you know it's it's uh might be some projection there when we think about these little gray aliens um my my wife and i were in uh in italy a few weeks ago and we saw this group of models walking by and they like have like these long symmetrical faces with like high cheekbones and and uh really long limbs and i was like oh my god they look like a different species right <laughs> like like you know they're they're just like evolved they almost look like aliens you know um or what we would think aliens would look like and now, uh now, sorry, go interestingly ahead. i was just going to say you yeah know, darwin came up with this theory of natural selection uh through a pretty intense study of artificial selection Mm -hmm. of, of dogs and pigeons and sheep and things like that. So what you're talking about, if, if you're looking into the future, if there was some kind of breeding program, mm -hmm. you could actually push humans off in a particular direction. Right. That, that is not a popular idea. And I'm not proposing it. Yeah, I, no, I, no. I've, I've heard that idea before in around World War II. <laughs> yeah, to generate a certain type, it has, right. to, has to be by design. Yeah, yeah. And, and there has to be breeding involved. Otherwise, it's just selecting out this certain type for a certain activity. But it will, it will <laughs> dissipate, and you'll have to find more people of that type. Of mm -hmm. course, ideas of beauty, when you think about that, I mean, you said you were in Italy. If you looked mm -hmm. at the paintings from the Middle Ages, they placed a high premium on some fairly robust females. Mm -hmm. You did not see a lot of skinny models. Yeah. With medieval paintings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I I agree. Um, it's uh it's definitely interesting how beauty has changed with the uh, society as well. Um, that's cool that you that you talked about uh close encounters. It's a really good 
Good one. Um, one of the things that I, I also ask my guests is, you know, where do you hope that we are in the next hundred years to kind of counter to to make us the best version of ourselves? Like so specifically, your your uh, idea of you know the the jaws getting smaller, us having this disevolution process. What I see or what I think of is I think that we need to get back to our roots, that we need to become more like that apex of the hunter-gatherer society so that we kind of maximize what our bodies were created for, which is, you know, the the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. What do you see us in a hundred years if like you could get all rid of all the French fries and and make sure that, you know, this was Dr. Scott's ideal utopian scenario? What How, how does that look to you? Well... I, w- I wish I could be more optimistic about mankind, but given the what's happening in the world today, it makes me very nervous mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. think that one megalomaniac could set into action the de- basically the destruction of the planet. Yeah, right? that makes me so nervous that we don't have more checks and balances on that, and yeah. I honestly do not understand. How throughout history, all these megalomaniacs, and I include not just people like Hitler, but people like Alexander the Great, how they were able to convince tens of thousands of young men to die, basically supporting their egomaniacal goals. When are we going to change that? Yeah, I I mean... That's certainly a very glass is half empty kind of level, yeah. but, but you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I think I have more faith in the human species. I think that we've had those people and terrible things may or may not have happened, but we've always survived and persevered. So, um, so I, I have more faith, I think in us, uh, but, you know, certainly I, I see what you're saying. I, I think that there, there is a certain thing about charisma that's a little scary, right? I mean, you you have the ability to to get a group together, and you can do so much with a group. And uh, I just I think that when I look at these types of things, I think that the Martin Luther King quote, "The arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice." I think that it also bends towards human surviving. So I hope that I hope that you're wrong, but the. Uh, God, I hope I'm wrong too. I have grandkids. <laughs> so, uh, last question: um, Are you doing anything in your research now that you feel like is really showing you that human beings are getting better? You know, is it is is there anything that that's out there that is in the anthropological record that, like, okay, like this portion of you know, um, evolution might not be for the best, but this portion is getting for the better. Like, I, I, like for example, we, we talked about how brain capacity was larger in the Paleolithic era, but we are all getting smarter. And I think that's a good thing. I think that the more smart people we have out there, the more understanding there is, the more um, likely that, you know, you, we can become a, a better society through better technology and and better breakthroughs. What are some things in your field that you see that, you know, gives you hope for the future? (laughs) I was thinking more of things that make me nervous about. (laughs) (laughs) I need you to turn that switch and reverse it, buddy. (laughs) It's like we, we keep coming up with labor saving devices. And like you said before, we want to get back to things that made us a healthier uh, more energ- energetic group, but with things like artificial intelligence and virtual reality, you know, I see these things about, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s, you know, I was outside most of the time riding my bicycle and and having clawed fights and building forts. And now sometimes kids hardly ever leave their houses. Mm-hmm. They're, they're tied up in video games and so I, I'm I'm like I sound like a nattering nabob of negativism. <laughs> well, it, I my counter argument to that is I think that once robots become ubiquitous, that we'll have more free time to explore things like physical activity. I think the biggest issue is that 
we all come home at the end of the day from sitting in front of a computer screen and we're just exhausted. Nobody wants to go to the gym. Nobody wants to do that. And the, the, the what you want is that quick little fix of, of eating French fries to, to get you through to the next point. You know, like when I'm on vacation, I want to go walking. I want to do that because I don't have the added stress of needing to provide for my family or needing to get this done by X deadline. Um, that just seems like when there's more hours in the day, personally, I don't know how you feel, but I tend to do a little bit more physical activity. Now the video games thing is a real thing, but, um, I'm, I'm thinking more about people who are, you know, over the age of 18, what they, what they have access to them, uh, selves when they come home at the end of the day. But it, it, it is a changing world. I can really see it in my students. And so uh, literally at this point in time, you know, if you if you had a question, I used to get into arguments with my dad that would go unresolved. But now if I get into an argument, I say, let's Google it. I mean, you can do research on your phone anywhere you are. Exactly. But yeah. But but my fervent hope, you know, they have found that happiness is coincident with education. Mm-hmm. And some of the most highly educated countries in Europe uh, are are the happiest. Like in Finland, that that is the happiest country in Europe. And I think like eighty one percent of the people are college educated. Mm-hmm. Now, I wish to God we could get college costs down so more people could get a college education. But because education opens your mind to the world, I think it makes you more more tolerant. Mm-hmm. And and more empathetic, and I think that's that's what we need to see in the future. I mean, uh, to get people to realize that you know there are good trends going on. The whole thing about diversity and inclusion. I grew up before civil rights, mm-hmm. and it was not good. But mm-hmm. things are definitely getting better in that regard. There's still a lot of intolerance, but most of that intolerance is grounded in ignorance. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, the next, you know, I've seen uh, tremendous improvements in my lifetime in, in tolerance. And so it's cert- we're certainly not there yet, but I'm optimistic that uh, we will ultimately become a more tolerant society where people are judged based on merit. And not sex, gender, race, ethnicity, anything like that. So yeah, that's great. That's that's a really cool uh, note to end on. And I really appreciate speaking with you, Dr. Scott. Um, you know, this is like I said, a personal interest of mine. So I really, really enjoyed this conversation. For those of you guys who are listening, uh, please feel free to follow Dr. Scott on his social media. He's a really interesting guy. Especially check out his TED Talk. It really blew my mind. Uh, But for those of you guys who are uh, following us on a regular basis, I will see you in the future. Have a great evening. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.